right, good morning everyone. Welcome back after the break and the uh, midterm exam. So you see here today we are going to enter the second part of the course, which means we are going to the more advanced graphics stuff. So from the book, if you look at the book, we have ch handled everything but one chapter for, which is uh, labeled there as basics. And that is what we are talking about today, the perspective projection. But everything else will then be the uh, more advanced things. So uh, starting next lecture, we will also do more, like uh, it will be more on the algorithm side and less on the mathematics side. But today will be the last lecture, which is really pretty heavy on the mathematics. The good news is almost half of it or more than half of it should actually be very familiar with, uh, with you already because it's basically built on what we have learned so far. Good. Um, yeah, so just to refresh our memory, this is a, an image from the very first lecture where I introduced this graphics pipeline. And the reason I put it there is to highlight that there is one step in there that we haven't really talked about yet that we always uh, pretty much assumed it works somehow, which is the projection of the 3D geometry onto our 2D screen, which of course you have already done in the practicals, but you use an API for it. And today we wanna look into what is going on behind those functions when you call them, when we actually do the projection from this 3D representation of the object to the 2D representation of it on the screen. So to do that, of course, the, the difficult thing here is that when we do this projection, we have to consider that people see or a scene in a certain perspective. And there are, of course, different ways to represent perspective in an image. In graphics, we are usually interested in linear perspective. Um, as the name suggests, where uh, linear plays a certain role, as, for example, compared to uh, other more distorted uh, perspectives, such as, for example, a fish eye view, where you just know there is in the center, it's enlarged, and then you have some distortions at the sides, which make the, the area a little smaller, or the, the relations between objects a little smaller. But in graphics, we're dealing with linear, usually uh, we're mostly dealing with linear perspective, which uh, can again be distinguished in different types, and the two most important types are these parallel projection and the perspective projection, which are illustrated by these two images here. And if you look at these two images, you see, of course, they both represent a 3D object that was projected onto the screen, but you also see they represent it in a different way. On the left side, you see, or both of them, I think you would agree intuitively that this looks like a 3D version, uh, a 3D a cube in 3D projected on a 2D screen. But the left side, you see, for example, that the, the, the front of the, of the cube is like a, a square where you have axis parallel, uh, where the axis, opposite axes are parallel to each other. Whereas on the right side, you also intuitively assume that the front is a square, but it is not, the sides are not parallel to each other. So if you take this in isolation, it doesn't, it is not really a square on the screen. The left is also not a square, it's a parallelogram, but you see that the opposite sides are parallel, so it looks more like a square, yet intuitively we would assume that the right side looks actually more like a realistic version of a circle. So we call this uh, projection on the left side a parallel projection because it does indeed, from the characteristics you see here at the bottom, it keeps parallel lines parallel and it also preserves the size and the shape of planar objects um, <clears throat> and we achieve this uh, mathematically by taking uh, by projecting an object a 3d object onto a 2d image plane which is our 2d screen by projecting each point in a certain projection direction which is usually uh, perpendicular to the image plane so we have the image plane here and then we have a projection uh, direction, and then we project it in a right angle towards this image plane. And we do this for all the points that we have here. And of course, there are variations of it. So for example, and this is usually called an orthographic projection, where we look into the direction of the projection or the opposite direction. There are, of course, others where we do not look straight at the projection area. So this is the Actually, the image might be a little confusing. This is the viewing direction here, this here, and that defines if it is orthographic or oblique. Um, this is uh, something we will not really talk about, and mostly in graphics, of course, we use this 
orthographic projection. I just uh, bring it here for completeness to illustrate you. There are, of course, a lot of variations of this, and we only talk about the major things here. Um, also, a quick uh, uh, reminder or an important note, the, uh, there are different uh, um, definitions of this, what is orthographic, what is oblique. Also, later, when we talk about these uh, coordinate systems today, I stick very much to the notation from the book, because this is the theory part of the course, and I think it's uh, uh, the least confusing for you when you look up uh, the theory part in the book and then they use the same notation there. But if you use a certain API, they might use different phrasings or different names for naming conventions. So always be careful when, when, you, when you do that in, uh, in which context. Good. Yeah, so this is, uh, like I said, the projection on the left side, which is... Uh, we, I think you would all agree, it represents a cube in 3D, but it's not the most realistic one because if we think about how we see objects when we look, or how we see a scene when we look as humans, we have a certain uh, perspective view of it that uh, makes sure that, for example, if someone is, something is further away, it appears smaller, whereas here, if you look at the cube on the left side, the back side of the cube has the same size as the front side because, of course, in real life, uh, these sides have the same size, but when we see them in perspective, the one that is further away should actually be smaller if it's realistic. In the same way as if I put up my hand, I cannot see most of you sitting here in the back, although each individual of you is much larger than my hand, because you are further away from me, so for me you appear much smaller. And uh, this is then done by this so-called perspective projection and very mathematically do not project in a certain direction, but we project towards a viewpoint, which of course in real life is our eyes and in a, in a computer simulation is then the camera position. So we have our image plane again here, but then we have a viewpoint and instead of a projection direction, we're projecting towards this viewpoint here which then, of course, results in a situation that if we have a similar triangle here that has the same size as this one, it appears much smaller on the screen, of course, because this projection here is uh, towards this single viewpoint. And again, we make this decision, decision can make this distinguishing between oblique and non-oblique, but again, we will only talk about this case here that the camera is placed and in the center of the image uh, of the image plane and that we look with our camera towards the image plane at the right angle. So this is the case we're going to cover. Good. So the question is how can we achieve this? How can we calculate this? And like I said, this is, you have already done this in the practicals, of course, but uh, so far you used the API and the API, the API did all the processing. We want to look into now what is going on behind those functions when you call them, which of course is always uh, important to know, not just that something works, but also how something works, because if it doesn't work, then you are having a, have, it's much easier to debug, for example, your code when you know what's really going on beyond those functions when you call them. Good. So how do we do that? How do we map the 3D world onto a 2D screen? Well, if you think about what we did so far in the course, you can kind of uh, probably come up uh, with the idea that this will be, end up in matrix multiplication again, because what we're doing here is actually transforming vectors from a 3D to a 2D space, or you can see the 2D space, the screen as a 2D subspace, a plane in a 3D space, and then it's just moving the vectors from this position in the 3D world to the position onto the right position in the 2D world. And the question is, of course, what kind of matrices do we need to make this mapping from the 3D world to the 2D world, which is the image plane, um, in a way that makes it really uh, a prospectively correct image. So uh, let's see what we have. We have a, a, a 3D scene described in a coordinate system, which we call a word space. Again, be careful in a specific API, this might be called differently. Here, I stick to the notation of the book mostly, which uh, describes this as a world space, which kind of makes sense because this is the way uh, the space we describe our virtual world with. And we know that we can describe each vector by a linear combination of the base vectors. And now we want to create a 3D image, uh, a 2D projection of a 3D image of that scene on our screen. So we place our image plane somewhere by putting a camera into our scene. So for example, we put it here and then we say we're looking in this direction and then we have an image plane here and now we want to know how do these objects look 
on this image plane if we are looking in that direction as if we are looking through a glass window on this scene if it would be a real scene. And of course the way to, to describe this is of course again with vectors. We use one vector to describe the position of the camera. We call this the I vector or sometimes it's also called camera vector. Again I stick to the notation of the book which calls it an I vector in this context. Sometimes I think they also use camera vector because yeah it's a virtual camera or it's a re that represents our eyes. And a gaze vector which specifies of course the direction of the camera because just by the location we still don't know where we are looking at or where we are pointing the camera at. So we also need to identify the pointing direction which is done by a gaze vector. And then we have two other parameters which implicitly also influence what we are seeing and that is of course the distance of the viewing plane from the camera. So that is not drawn here but that is this here. The distance, let's call it D, then I have less to write the distance here from the camera uh, and also the field of view of the camera which is of course depends also on the distance if you make the distance shorter the field of view gets wider so the field of view is basically the range that is covered by the camera and uh, you see here by those two parameters the size of the image plane that by those parameters the size of the image plane which is indirectly then specified by the distance and the field of view of the camera, they influence what parts of the scene we see. So if we have objects here, of course we don't see them. So when we do the calculation, the projection, we only have to consider the objects that are within this range, which is why we specify this range in a, a specific way. We call this range actually the view frustum, and it is of course defined by these limiting side planes that we have. We have on the left side a plane that is called sometimes L, on the right side a plane R which are defined by the field of view of the camera. So you have here the field of view and then of course that implicitly defines a left and a right plane. It also, this is of course the top view to illustrate it easier, but if we look at the uh, uh, from the side in real 3D we also have of course a restriction at the top and at the bottom. So this is the kind of cone or pyramid that we can see with our camera. But um, we also see here we have two limitations which are two planes that bound this few frustum which are called N and F which are for near and far plane and the reason for that is of course in front of you, you could say it makes uh, you could model everything, but there are, there are of course problems when you have. First of all, if this is your screen, you might not want to model objects that are in front of the screen. Also, you might run into position problems uh, when you have objects that are too close, which is why we restrict our view frustum to the front with a near plane. For the distance, you can argue, well, of course, I want to see everything that's there, but of course, you cannot calculate with infinite numbers, so you have to make a restriction, and also it's kind of logical if you have an object that is really very, very far away, you cannot see it anymore, so it is also, from a calculation point of view, makes sense to restrict also the distance, and we do this by this so-called far plane. And that then defines this sort of cut-off pyramid that we see here indicated in gray that is called the view frustum and it contains all the objects that we can draw uh, that we will see on the screen when we do the perspective projection. And for today we will restrict ourselves to wireframe models so we will not look into the color, we will just look into the vectors that represent for example a triangle or a geometric object and project them and then we can connect them, but then we have a wireframe model. We will look into the shading and the rasterization uh, in a later lecture. Another thing that we'll cover in a later lecture is cases like this here, where objects are partly outside of the field frustum, so we will only look into objects today that are inside of the field frustum, because for those that are uh, partly outside of it, we have to do a special treatment, and we'll cover this in a later lecture also. Good. So we have now defined our camera space, we have our, uh, uh, our camera position, our world space and our view frustum, what we see with the camera and we want to do the projection and to do that of course it would be much easier if the camera would not be at an arbitrary position but if it would be at the origin. So for example you see it here, if the camera is at the origin and we're looking in negative set direction then the plane equation 
becomes minus n for the top front of the fuel thrust and for the back, uh, for the near and for the far plane it becomes minus s so the, that will of obviously make our calculation much easier and of course what we do is what we can do is we can just transform it by multiplying it with a matrix and then we transform it to we transform the origin of our co coordinate system to the position of the camera and that we say we transform the world space into the camera space and we can do this with matrix multiplication and we'll see the correct matrix later. So this would make, will make our calculation much easier and then we want to do the perspective projection and that is of course a very uh, complex and difficult step. It would be much easier if we could do an orthographic projection because the orthographic projection if we have a point x y z here then of course the orthographic projection of that is just the point x y because we're just ignoring the third coordinate. So that is a very simple calculation. It's actually not a calculation. It's just throwing away one coordinate. Whereas this mapping here from x, y, z to a point x, I call it x, s, y, s, because it's uh, the x and s, y value on the screen, they are much more complicated. And of course, the solution, you already see it here by this big fat arrow that I have here. The solution we are doing is we're not calculating this projection, but we you introduce a matrix multiplication that will transform the objects in our few frustum into uh, in a way that is uh, in a uh, axis pa uh, parallel uh, in, in an area that is bounded by axis parallel planes and that allows us then to do an orthographic projection and this transformation here has to be done in a way that it preserves the relative sizes and the relative distances between objects in a way that the orthographic projection here produces exactly the same result as the perspective projection here. So if you look at this point here, it is projected towards this point on the screen. So we need to transform this point here to another point here that when we do an orthographic projection results in the very same point. And if we can do that, then of course we have a very easy case to do the projection. The difficult step will, of course, be this one here. Good. And when we have that, then again, of course, uh, we can make our calculation easier by saying, well, we just put the values between 0, minus 1 and 1. That will make our calculation easier. So we do it from this, or I forgot to say this, we call this box here the so-called orthographic view volume in contrast to the view frustum because it is a uh, orthographic view volume because it has the, the relations of the size preserved in a way that we can do an orthographic projection and that to make the calculation easier we can transform in a so-called canonical view volume it's called canonical because the values are between minus one and one and then of course we can easily do the projection which is basically just throwing away the third coordinate the set coordinate onto our 2D Green, but then of course we have the values between minus one and one so we also need to do then a mapping to the actual window or screen that we want to display it on so for example if we have an 800 or six, uh, to 600 pixel screen or window that we want to uh, to uh, to show our uh, our, uh, our 2d scene in then we just have to do this uh, transformation which is basically a window scaling which we can do with a simple matrix multiplication in fact we can do all of these steps with a matrix multiplication which is of course one of the, the reasons why these matrices are so important in graphics. Uh, there is only one step which is a little more difficult or it's actually quite more difficult because we need to introduce a new extension of matrix multiplication of the, the homogeneous coordinates but everything else is actually something that we could do already with what we've learned in the lecture about uh, matrix transforma uh, vector transformation. So we have here, a we can uh, break down this huge step in a lot of single matrix multiplications that then can later be combined into one big matrix that is then our projection matrix but because we have these single steps here we call this the graphics pipeline or this is the essence of the graphics pipeline and then there are these extension to it like the shading and all the other stuff that we include there and this is now you see now why I put up this uh, reminder slide from the very first lecture which the uh, the overview of the graphics pipeline Good. Yeah, so uh, like I said, everything but this step here
is very simple. So let's do this step last and let's look into all the other steps first. Let's start from the bottom up. Let's look at first the windowing transformation. So let's assume we have all our transformations done that a scene, the scene that we have is now in this so-called canonical view volume, which goes from minus one to one in all of the three dimensions. So we have here our scene with triangles that are preserved in the original size that they had. So we can do then an orthographic projection onto the screen. Let's assume the front here is our screen. And then we get here the triangle on the screen and we get also this triangle here on the screen. So this is our 2D screen here. And we can do, of course, the projection by just throwing away the third coordinate, because like I said, that is basically just from x, y, set to x, y. But of course, then we are in a 2 cross 2 box. So we need to do a windowing transformation, and that is Really simple. In fact, you have already done this in the very first tutorial, only then you didn't use matrix multiplication. You just calculated, uh, wrote down the, uh, the the calculation that you need to do. So what we need to do here, we have, let's say this is an 800 cross 600 uh, uh, pixel size image, for example. Then, of course, we need to first scale, we need to scale it. So if we say this here is an X, then of course, half of it is an x half, same here of course, an x half. So if we scale it from 0, 1 or from 0, minus 1 to this size, we just multiply it by an x divided by 2. So we see here in the scaling matrix for x, we get an x divided by 2, the same for y in the y direction, and then we have our size window screen. So we see this is a very simple scaling operation, but of course then we still have the origin in the center, which doesn't fit to the conventions that we usually have in our API. Like in the lecture, I usually use the origin on the left bottom. Most implementations, you have it at the top bottom, uh, top bottom, at the bottom left or at the bottom right? No. Bottom left and top left. Yeah, it's early in the morning for me as well. So, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so we want to have the origin there. So we also need to do a translation. And of course, instead of being in the center now, it should be at the bottom left. So we need to just subtract uh, at this here. Sorry. Yeah, I made the, the mistake. Be careful here. Uh, the way I'm draw, drew it here looks, if I draw it like that, it looks like you need to subtract it. But actually what we want to do is we do not want to shift the origin. What we want to is we have this image here and the origin is in the center and we want to have it in the bottom left. So you need to move the image up. And that means you have to have plus an x divided by two here and, and, uh, and y divided by two here. So uh, this is, uh, be careful, I, I drew this in a, in a confusing way. So forget about it. Good, yeah. Another thing you, you realize here, of course, I uh, have drawn this coordinate system here, not really directly at the corner of this grid, but in the center of one cell. And of course, that was on purpose. Because you remember that we represent, we had this before, I think in one case where we uh, said that we represent the pixels by the center of the cell, which means that technically you also have to add a minus one half here, because if we're dealing with pixels, then this is half of a pixel. So this is minus one half to make sure that you're in the center of the cell. Good, but this is then our simple transformation matrix. And since we are in 2D now, of course, this is just a transformation in 2D. So we need only a three cross three matrix, two for the 2D vectors. And this is, of course, the homogeneous coordinates that we need for the translation here. But of course, if we want to later then combine it with all these matrices here that we have on the left, then we're combining them with 3D matrices as well, which then with homogeneous coordinates are 4 cross 4 matrices. So what we do here is to be able to do that, we just enter a line here. So we have x, y, and these are the homogeneous coordinates. And then, of course, here we have the set value, which we don't need for the actual projection or once we projected it. But 
we need it for the calculation that it fits later. So we just enter a line here that doesn't change anything else and just drags the set value along. There is another reason why we want to drag the set value along, which we will talk about next week or next lecture, um, which is that, and that's the, is the limitations that we make today that is that we look only into wireframe models. And if you only have wireframe models, then of course it doesn't matter which object is first because you only see the grid of it on the screen anyhow. But if you have filled objects, and of course one object is in front of the other, then of course uh, you do, should not paint a draw the, that one that is behind because if it's a solid object, you don't see it from your perspective. So uh, we need to know which object is in front of the other, which is why we need the information of the set value where it is located, we don't need it to draw because we're not drawing in that direction, in that dimension, but we need it to specify which one is first, which is also why we want to drag it along. So we do this by just entering a line here, entering this, this line here, this row and this column. Good, yeah, so this is our first matrix, the one that does this uh, operation here. And of course, so let's work our way up. What is this matrix here? that moves this axis parallel box that has all the sizes preserved uh, correctly, but is somewhere in our space to this canonical view volume, which is this compact uh, regular box around the center, around the origin, this two cross two cross two box. And of course, this is again a simple scaling uh, operation. So you see here uh, for the, uh, first of all, to get it uh, across uh, around the center, around the origin, what we have to do is, for example, for the, uh, if we have the center here and we want to move that center to the origin, for the x value, for example, you see it's from the left to the right. So the center is left plus right divided by two. So we have to subtract left plus right divided by two. And that is the part where why I said, uh, don't be, be careful with the plus and the minus here, because here we are moving the object to the origin in the other case, we had everything already centered around the origin and moved the scene in a way that it, uh, trans it pushed the, the origin to the left bottom, which is why in the other case we had a plus, here we have a minus. So just be, be careful with it, but if you look at the image, you will see and understand that this is just a, a simple translation. You will understand why in one case we are moving the object, uh, why, uh, why we have a plus or minus, because we're moving different things here. Good, so this is just uh, for the x-axis is clear and for the y and the set axis it should be also clear that this way we get the center of the box to the center to our, our origin and then we just have to do a simple scaling which is um, again just a simple windowing trans uh, like in the windowing transformation we look at the whole distance and then we want to map this to minus one and one so this is, uh, should be mapped to minus one, zero, one. So we need to take the whole divided by two and then divide it by this length. And if we divide it by this length, of course, we get this factor here that we have in our scaling matrix. And then we can, of course, combine the two matrices. First we did the translation, then we did the scaling. So we end up with this matrix here, which is then the previous one that we have here. But be careful, I'm working my way up from the bottom now. So this was the first matrix and this is the second matrix. But when we apply to the vector, of course, the vector is here. So we are doing it then this direction here. So that means this is the second matrix and this is the first one. So be careful with the order. Good. So like I said, this step is the most difficult one. So let's exclude it for now and let's look into this camera transformation first, which is also a simple transformation that we already knew before uh, or that we had or, or everything that I'm explaining now is something that we had before. Um, actually, if we had more time and less people, I would probably ask someone of you to say it or to come here and explain it. Oh, you're lucky that we don't have that much time. I'm not grabbing someone, but uh, I'm pretty sure most of you would be able to figure it out what we're doing here. Um, so what we do is we want, we have a world space expressed with these coordinates, X, Y, and Z. And we want, we have a camera represented by the I vector and the gaze vector. And what we want to now is to have our coordinate system aligned with the camera position. So we basically want to 
move everything here and then have it have the axes aligned with each other. And uh, of course, to do that, first of all, we need this coordinate system for the camera because we only have the position and the gaze vector, which indirectly, of course, define a coordinate system that we can trans uh, that we can map then to the original one. But uh, we need to to write it down. And we had this in relation to a rotation about a random vector in 3D that we uh, also created a coordinate system so we can could map it to the original coordinate system and then do a rotation around one of the axes. But in this case, it's... Uh, and, and we did that by saying, OK, we have a random vector. So we just take a random vector that is not parallel to it, do the scalar product, and then we have a vector that is perpendicular to the original one, then we multiply these two with each other, and then we get a third one that is perpendicular to that. And that's, of course, how we are doing it here. Also, we take a random vector, multiply it with the gaze vector, then we get a vector. So this is the gaze vector. Then we get a vector multiplied with the random vector that is not parallel to the gaze vector. Then we get a vector u. And then we multiply these two, which has a right angle, these two with each other, and then we get a vector v, and of course the g we can then call uh, w because we usually use uvw, and that way we can get our uh, coordinate system. There is only one thing that is different from what we had before, which is that in this case, in the rotation case, we said we can use any kind of coordinate system as long as one of the axes contains the one that we want to rotate around. Um, you probably remember we had this, this, I had this image where we had this uh, rotation and then I said, okay, we can map this. If we use a random vector, of course, we end up having different coordinate system, but it doesn't matter because we mapped it to the original one. Then we did a rotation, for example, around 45 degrees and then we mapped it back. And as long as this mapping back is exactly the opposite uh, operation to the original mapping, it doesn't really matter if I rotate it from here to here about 45 degrees and then move it back, or if I rotate it from here to here 45 degrees and then rotate it back, as long as this mapping to this position and the mapping back is exactly the opposite and matching uh, operation. Now, in this case, of course, we're not moving back again. We just do the one mapping, so we really have to make sure that the axes are aligned, which means we cannot take an arbitrary vector, but we have to take a vector that, when we do the vector product, uh, the, the, the cross product with it, results in a vector that is not only perpendicular to G, because that would be all vectors in that plane here, but that is also parallel then to the actual screen that we have, which is, of course, also perpendicular to G. So, and we do this by using a vector that we call the so-called view up vector, which is a vector that is in the plane that splits the head of the viewer in two. So if I'm looking in that direction, then assume a, par uh, a plane that is like this, that splits my head in half, left and right, and then any vector on that plane that points up is, of course, a view up vector, and it really doesn't matter which one we take as long as it's on the plane, because in any case, we will end up with a right angle that goes uh, to the side where we want to. So this is the only difference that we have here, a plane that really splits our camera in two halves vertically, and then uh, we end up with the right vector here. Good. And another thing we have to do, of course, is if we want to have an uh, orthonormal uh, 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 coordinate system, we have to normalize all the vectors to have unit vectors, and you see later why we are having, why we want to do that. Usually, it's to make the calculation easier, and yeah, that's how it will be. Good. So we have this coordinate system now, and now we want to map this to the world coordinates, and we do this by first, by again splitting it in simpler steps. The first is just map the origins, align the origins with each other, and the second step is then align the coordinate systems with each other. So if you look at the image, uh, first we map the origin to each other, and that is, of course, a simple translation. We have the origin, the, the origin of our coordinate system, of our camera's coordinate system is defined by the I vector. So we just need to subtract the I vector, and then we have them aligned here, and of course, subtract them also from all the objects here, 
and then of course we are here at this position and then we have the coordinate the origins of the two aligned and then we have to align the base vectors which means it's just a simple rotation so we just need to rotate these two base vectors by an angle phi that maps them to the original base vectors. It's actually not that simple because it's in 3D, so it's not just one rotation as it suggests here because I've drawn it from the top view because that's uh, easier to draw and uh, illustrate. But of course, you see here there's, it's pointing out so a 3D scene. So the rotation is not that simple, but it's a simple 3D rotation. So it is something that we should already know. The only problem is, of course, where do we get this angle? And here it comes into play that we use an orthonormal basis because if you think about it, we don't know the angle here, but what we do know is, of course, the, the vectors here, and we used actually the same trick for the, for the rotation around the arbitrary area uh, vector uh, with the transformation matrices already, that we set uh, here. Um, we, we don't know we want these vectors here, but if we look into what what would be the transformation matrix, the rotation matrix, to map just the opposite direction, to map these vectors onto this one. Now, if you remember that the columns of this, this is a linear transformation, and for linear transformations, the columns of the transformation matrix are the matrices are the images of the linear of the base vectors under the linear transformation. And of course, if you rotate it in a way that these base vectors map these base vectors, then of course the images are exactly the base vectors where you want to map it in on. So we just have to write here down the vectors, the base vectors of our, co of our camera coordinate system, and then we have our rotation matrix. And that, of course, is for the opposite rotation that we want. So for our rotation, we need the inverse of it, and here it comes into play that we have an orthonormal basis, because if you remember with the, when we used the trick for the rotation uh, around an arbitrary area uh, vector in 3D, the inverse of it is just it's transposed because the, uh, the vectors are unit vectors and are perpendicular to each other. So here we have the vectors u, v, and w. If we write them in a line here, then we get exactly our rotation matrix. So you see here, this is just a simple uh, transformation with all the stuff that we already did in another context. And that way, we can get the final matrix here. So we have this one here, this one here, this one here. So the only step that is missing now is transforming this view frustum into the orthographic view volume that allows us to do an orthographic projection. But of course, if we don't do that step, then we end up getting an orthographic projection. So we do uh, have everything now to do this orthographic projection, this cube that you saw on the left side in the initial image, but not the one that we do for, uh, the, for the perspective projection. So we need one more matrix, um, unless, of course, we stick with orthographic projection, um, which is actually also quite often used in graphics. Um, for example, in the book, they mention a lot that it is very. Uh, they mention that it is a lot of a uh, lot used in technical drawings or architectural drawings because then, basically, in every situation where the absolute sizes are important or length or uh, relation to each other are important because it of course preserves the length like I showed you with the, the cube the back side had the very same size the very same shape as the front side which is not realistic but it is from a technical understanding from the size of course for a technical drawing sometimes better but also we see it in games I just by coincidence I, I saw this uh, uh, typical games like these uh, world building games or god games where you can create a city or so they actually very often use this also this uh, kind of uh, uh, this, this orthographic or parallel projection because you don't see the perspective here so and you see here this is from the Simpsons games on the, on the on iPhone or Android where you can build then a, a, your own version of uh, uh, Springfield and there you see here that the perspective doesn't really look realistic, but that is because it is a parallel projection. But of course, you can use this, and of course, this makes a lot of things easier when you do the game design. So doing this in a perfect pr 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 uh, perspective is probably not really that good for the gameplay. But um, 
uh, yeah, so, so you see it is so something that we use, but it doesn't really look that realistic and not just because the people are yellow and only have four fingers, but because the perspective is not what we have in a real situation. So we have to talk about how to get this uh, perspective projection. But since this is, of course, a longer step, uh, this would be a good uh, time for a break. But since we have a few minutes, I will probably just skip to the last one and bring the organizational uh, remarks now. Thank you.